For those of you interested in building a weather station, you probably come across this inexpensive commercial assembly manufactured by Argent Data Systems. You can purchase this as a completed assembly with an included microcontroller directly from Argent for $155. The system is advertised as sending data in a Pete Brothers data logger format for use with Virtual Weather Station and WeatherView 32. I personally don't know what those systems are, and it's fine if you simply want to integrate this weather station with one of those recognized options. But what if you want to integrate it with a system that meets your own specialized needs, such as a remote environmental monitor capable of cellular or satellite telemetry? In this case, you can buy a barebone system at a discount from Argent or SparkFund for about $70. Note that if you go this route, the assembly only contains the sensors, so you'll need to provide your own microcontroller for signal processing. In addition, you'll need to write some code to read the signals from your sensors. Argent does provide some beta libraries to help you get started. This is certainly one way to go. But I have to admit that not being a programmer, I was a bit intimidated by the code and sparse documentation for these libraries. I certainly appreciate that these have been made available by Argent, but in order to understand how to integrate these sensors with my own applications, I decided it might be easier to develop and test a simple sketch that reports instantaneous values from each sensor. This video will summarize how I went about doing the same based on a teardown of the Argent wind vane, cup anemometer, and tipping bucket rain gauge for integration with an Arduino. In support of the same, I want to thank Argent for replying to my questions as I developed this video. Let's start by reading the specs and taking apart the weather vane. Here's the documentation for the weather vane. In summary, Argent explains the instrument is made up of a suite of reed switches, each tied to its own resistor. If attached to an external fixed resistor and voltage, this design can be used to create a suite of unique voltage divider circuits tied to each direction. The direction can be returned to our program in our microcontroller, depending on which reed switch is closed. Now that's a fairly complicated summary, so let's see if we can break it down starting with disassembly of the weather vane. There are three small screws holding the weather vane housing to the mounting block. I'll remove these first. Once removed, I can gently pull the housing away from the mount. Upon doing so, I noticed another three screws holding a printed circuit board in place in the housing. When I remove these, I can gently remove the PCB for a closer inspection. And this is what I found on the reverse side of the PCB once removed. As noted in the documentation, here we have a suite of reed switches, each tied to its own resistor. Each reed switch is closed when a magnet on the weather vane passes over the same as it aligns with wind direction. On the PCB, each resistor has a unique value tied to a given reed switch. As I'll explain in a second, this design gives us the ability to align the cardinal directions with our printed circuit board, thus giving us a means to tie a direction to a unique signal that can be registered by our microcontroller. In order to demonstrate how each direction can be uniquely identified, I attach the green and black leads of the weather vane to the leads of my multimeter. This is a screenshot of the demo I'll share. Here you'll be able to read the resistance generated by the weather vane at a given direction, which you can then compare to the published resistances provided by Argent. 
When the weather vane magnet aligns with a particular reed switch, the switch closes, allowing a unique voltage signal to be registered. Because each reed switch is associated with a particular resistor, each switch will generate its own voltage signal associated with the direction of the rotating vane. This is another schematic provided by the vendor that sheds a little more light on the mechanism. Here you can see that the directional signals are generated by a voltage divider circuit associated with a fixed 10 kilo ohm resistor at 5 volts. The unique resistor values result in a suite of unique voltage signals that can be measured by our microcontroller. To better understand how this setup works, let's zero in on one specific direction. Let's look at south located at 180 degrees. When our magnet closes the reed switch associated with the south direction, the 5 volt signal grounds through both our fixed 10 kilo ohm resistor as well as the resistor associated with the south direction. If our 5 volt power supply encounters the 10 kilo ohm resistor first, then this becomes R1 in our voltage divider circuit, and the resistor associated with south becomes R2. When we have two resistors in series like this, we can use this voltage divider equation to determine the voltage between R2 and ground. This shows the values we'll plug into our voltage divider equation and also shows where in the circuit we'll attach a lead so that we can measure V out. Using the voltage divider equation, we can predict what the voltage signal will be at this location for this particular resistor combination which in turn will be a function of where the magnet on our weather vane is sitting as the vane aligns with wind direction. We can then attach a lead from the circuit to an analog pin on our Arduino and then write some code to correlate the associated voltage signal to a direction. Keep in mind that the values presented in this table will be a function of a given voltage and fixed resistor. If we change either or both of those values, the respective signal values in the table will also change. This explains how we generate the signals correlated to these principal cardinal directions. But how are the signals correlated when the weather vane magnet falls between two directions? In this case, the magnet will cause two switches to close simultaneously resulting in current running through two resistors instead of one. In this case, we can use this equation to determine what the equivalent R2 resistance will be for the associated direction, thus giving us a unique voltage signal at this location. We shouldn't forget that Arduino analog pins convert voltages to digital values for reference in our sketches. Since Arduino analog pins are capable of discretizing voltages into 1,023 parts, we use this relationship to determine how the voltages will be registered in code. And this shows how to calculate the respective digital value for a 0.62 volt signal. Specifically, a 0.62 volt signal detected on an Arduino analog pin will be registered in code as an integer of value 127 once rounded up. Using these relationships, we can determine what the expected digital signal will be for all the voltages realized by our weather vane as a function of direction, input voltage, and our fixed resistor, and assuming our resistors were perfectly made. However, these discrete values are subject to change due to potentially loose tolerances for our resistors and or impedance associated with our wires and connections. We've already seen this in the previous demonstration, so I decided to buffer these values a bit. If we assume a 5% tolerance for our fixed resistor will translate to a 5% variability in our signal, we can determine what the expected min and max digital signal response will be for each direction. I believe that's a conservative assumption, so that's what I've done in this table although I had to adjust the range for some directions to prevent signal overlap. Respective adjustments are shown in blue font. This table can then be expressed as a suite of integer arrays as shown here for each direction, which can then be imported into my sketch. The simplest code for determining direction is presented here. Here you can see the arrays developed from the tables already shared and 
Here's a for loop that cycles through the arrays until the incoming signal from the weather vane falls within an acceptable range for a given direction. The associate angle is then echoed to a serial terminal for reference. By echoing the angle to a serial terminal, I can also display the results in a processing sketch. This will help me visually demonstrate that my approach at coding the weather vane is reasonable and working. So here's the setup that I'm going to demonstrate to show you that the code works. I've got my hacked weather vane hooked up to an Arduino. I've got a uh, 5 volt um, power signal going through the weather vane and uh, I've got my uh, voltage divider circuit on the breadboard and I've got my signal wire attached to pin A naught. And uh, here's a fritzing diagram of the way things are set up on my bench. And here's a close-up of what I'll be demonstrating. After doing all this work, I decided to see how my code compared to the library developed by John Cape for Argent. With respect to determining weather vane direction, he uses nested if-then statements that trigger according to a signal threshold. His thresholds are close to the expected values I calculated using the voltage divider equation. Since he's not using arrays, I'm guessing his approach is also a little gentler on memory requirements. Regardless, I think it's valuable to back out and independently determine how these numbers were arrived at so that I can build and improve upon the same moving forward. So as I mentioned before, this demonstration um, and the provided tables are specific to a 5 volt system with uh, the fixed resistor set at 10 kilo ohms. But what if I'm running, uh, say, a pro trinket in the field that's powered off a LiPo battery that's not capable of generating 5 volts? Uh, say I have this deployed and it's running off a LiPo battery that's being charged by a solar panel. In that event, uh, I can get a, a regulated 3.3 volts off the pro trinket, but that's going to change the values for my voltage divider circuit at a given fixed resistance. Having said that, uh, changing the input voltage from 5 volts to 3 volts will certainly change your output voltage, but uh, this won't impact the respective digital signal since a lower V-out signal is also compensated by a lower V-in for the analog to digital conversion. So uh, if you just change the voltage, it shouldn't really make a difference in regards to um, uh, the tables. However, if you change the fixed resistor, that will most definitely change the thresholds associated with your calculations. If you'd like to experiment with the sensitivity of output voltages and signals, I've prepared a spreadsheet where you can modify one or both of the circuit input variables and then see how that affects the output voltage and analog signal. As always, links to code and supporting documents like spreadsheets are available in the description of this video. Please note that although we now have a simple means to talk to our weather vanes with an Arduino, there is a lot more that goes into collecting and processing wind data to realize a representative velocity. An instantaneous direction may be an error due to wind eddies that introduce noise into a predominant wind direction. In response, Argent gave me the heads up about a method known as consensus averaging, which is used to determine an estimate of wind velocity from several measurements in environments with noisy data. The libraries shared by Argent employ consensus averaging, but note that these libraries are still in beta, so use with caution. The Argent rain gauge is made up of a tipping bucket mechanism with each tip correlated to 0.011 inches of rain. So all we need to do is count the tips for a given rainfall event and multiply by this 100th of an inch to determine the total rainfall depth for a given event. Before we get into the circuit, let's take apart the Argent rain gauge for a closer look.
For full context on how this gauge works, I'll share highlights from my chapter on tipping bucket rain gauges, summarize new experiments associated with increasing debounce constants, and share tests of Hall effect sensors as a replacement for the reed switches typically found in these instruments. Should you ever need it, I'll also share details about a hardware solution for filtering noise associated with reed switches. Let's start with the mechanics of the gauge. If you open up this gauge, what you'll find are two buckets of a known volume that are resting on a pivot point. When it rains, the rain collector will start to divert water to one of the buckets. As the bucket fills, the bucket assembly will eventually pivot and dump the rainwater out the bottom of the rain gauge. In the case of the gauge that I'll be demonstrating here, one tip of the bucket assembly is equal to one one hundredth of an inch. Eventually, the other half of the bucket assembly will fill with rainwater, and the process will repeat. In this case, I've had two tips of the bucket assembly, which is equal to two one hundredths of an inch. Now that we understand the hardware, you can see that all we really need to do with our Arduino is count the number of tips in order to gauge the depth of rainfall associated with an event. In order to do this, let's remove the rain collector assembly and take a closer look at what's inside the gauge. Here you can see the tipping bucket assembly, and attached to that assembly is a small magnet. So when that assembly pivots, it runs right next to this reed switch. And that, in turn, is something that we can hook up to our Arduino and monitor when the reed switch is activated by the magnet moving next to it. So here's a schematic of our hardware. Essentially what we have is just a switch that opens and closes when the bucket assembly pivots. The reed switch in our gauge is acting just like a regular old toggle switch. In fact, we can demonstrate this by hooking up a toggle switch to a multimeter and then monitoring continuity while we toggle that switch on and off. We can then compare that to what happens when we pivot the bucket assembly on our tipping bucket gauge hooked up to the same multimeter. So again, coming back to our simple schematic, all we're doing is replacing the switch in the schematic with a tipping bucket reed switch. And this is a close-up of what that reed switch looks like. You can see that uh, by default it's open. We put a magnet nearby, uh, the switch closes, and that allows for continuity to be established through our circuit. So in order to demonstrate this action, what I'm going to do is put my mic inside the gauge and then I'm going to slowly move that bucket assembly left and right. And as that magnet comes into proximity of the reed switch, if you listen very closely, you might be able to hear that reed switch uh, closing. And then as the magnet moves away from the reed switch, uh, the reed switch will open uh, to its normally open state. Next, let's hook up our gauge to our multimeter in continuity mode and do the same experiment, only this time listen for continuity as I'm pivoting the bucket. For the purposes of a tipping bucket rain gauge, we now understand that there's a reed switch that's closed when it's exposed to a magnet or when the bucket assembly pivots. The state of the circuit can be evaluated by an input pin on our Arduino. Uh, in my case, since I'm using an Adafruit Pro Trinket, the only interrupt pin available for monitoring this is pin 3. When the switch is open, there's no connection with the 5 volt power supply in the circuit. This results in pin 3 reading low, 
Note that you do need to pull this pin low by placing a 10K resistor between it and ground. This prevents the pin from floating, thus avoiding garbage data being read by the Arduino. When the switch is closed, our 5 volt power supply makes a connection with ground. This will result in pin 3 reading high. So this fairly simple test is giving me odd results. So the question is what could be causing my tip counter to increment by two on each tip? If we hooked up pin three to an oscilloscope, this is what we would expect to see over time. In reality, mechanical switches like reed switches and buttons or toggle switches actually create a little bit of noise or bounce in the signal that's uh, generated when the circuit is closed. Uh, we don't perceive this as humans because we're too slow, but microcontrollers can pick it up, which can certainly cause some problems. In software, we can filter out that noise by setting a debounce constant uh, to basically delay registration of, of what pin 3 is monitoring when there's a change so that that noise is filtered out. Having said that, I had experimented with various debounce constants up to 80 microseconds. 80 microseconds did address the false tips initially, but over time this sketch would randomly register false tips. So I checked the library shared by Argent Data Systems for comparison. In doing so, I found that Argent was using a significantly longer delay in their interrupt service request compared to what I had been attempting in my own code by three orders of magnitude on a microsecond scale, resulting in a delay of about 15 milliseconds. I mirrored Argent's debounce constant and increased the delay for the noise filter in the interrupt service request so that it would work exactly like the Argent library. And here are the results. Uh, so here's the revised sketch, and you can see that um, uh, if I scroll down, you can see that I've increased my uh, debounce time by three orders of magnitude relative to what uh, I had it prior. So let's see if this works. So I'm going to upload it. And here's my little pro trinket that I'm using to, uh, to run the test. There's my uh, tipping bucket rain gauge. It uses a reed switch, just like the ones in the Argent uh, rain gauges. Okay, so here goes. Okay, so you can see that my total tips right now are zero. I'm gonna switch hands here. And you can hear me tipping the bucket. So that looks pretty good. See what happens if I do like a rapid fire type uh, event. So that looks like it's working pretty well. Looks like I missed a tip there. And I would be interested in seeing how this uh, uh, Tipping bucket rain gauge performs uh, under rapid fire conditions because in Arizona we can have very intense monsoons which can cause that bucket to, to tip rapidly. So that is something that uh, I would want to capture. But this looks like, at least for this initial test, it looks like it's doing pretty well. So this is encouraging. I have a simple sketch that seems to work with tipping bucket rain gauges that takes into account the bounce associated with reed switches. As clearly summarized in this website, this sensor works on the principle of the Hall effect, which states that whenever a magnetic field is applied in a direction perpendicular to the flow of electric current, a voltage difference is induced.
A change in voltage can be used by an Arduino's interrupt pin to increment a counter when the sensor is in the vicinity of a magnet. The wiring for this hack is presented here, and since the tipping bucket already employs a magnet, it's an inexpensive and fairly simple hack that eliminates the mechanical noise associated with reed switches. Okay, so what I have here is a USGS tipping bucket rain gauge that was uh, donated to ZeroCraft and they subsequently donated it to me to play around with. And this originally uh, operated with a reed switch. And you can see that what I've done here is I've attached a little Hall effect sensor right there um, that will be activated by this magnet. So the idea here is to see if uh, using the original sketch that was giving me problems with the, uh, with the reed switch, uh, if I'll have similar bounce issues using this Hall effect sensor as a replacement for that reed switch. On that note, let's go ahead and upload this. Okay, it's done uploading. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is open up a serial terminal. Okay, and you can see that my total tips are zero. Now I'm going to come to my uh, bucket and I'm going to start tipping it. Let me bring you back to the screen. There's my first tip, second tip, third tip. I'm not getting multiples of two like I was getting with the reed switch on a short debounce time. So this is looking much better. So yeah, it looks like Hall effect sensors are the way to go for these tipping bucket rain gauges. Let's see what happens if I rapid fire this thing. I'm going to rapid fire it six times and let's see how well it performs. One, two, three, four, five, six. No problems there. So I wondered why these weren't standard hardware in these scientific instruments. And the reason may be the relatively higher cost of the Hall effect sensors relative to reed switches. So Hall effect sensors appear to be a viable alternative for the problems I encountered using reed switches. But what if you're concerned about taking apart these expensive instruments for sensor replacement? In this case, Jeremy Blum's Exploring Arduino book does an excellent job of explaining how to create an external hardware delay for remedying bounce introduced by noisy components like reed switches. This is summarized in chapter nine of this playlist, but for those of you who haven't reviewed that video, I'll go over it once again here. This is the circuit that Jeremy presents, and I've included a photo of an oscilloscope to help me track what's going on when the circuit is powered up. I should mention that this oscilloscope shot is just a kind of a conceptual drawing of, of me tracing the actions that are taking place in the circuit. I don't actually have an oscilloscope to make this work. Here, you'll notice I've introduced a capacitor and a Schmidt trigger, both of which are helping to smooth the output while also creating a hardware delay. The time of the delay will be determined by the value of the capacitor and circuit resistance, known as an RC circuit. Let's start with the circuit having an open switch similar to the state of the gauge when water is filling one of the buckets. With the switch open, our capacitor will start to charge. This will result in a high signal coming off the capacitor, which is inverted to low as measured by pin 3 when the signal passes through the Schmidt trigger. Now when the switch is closed, we have a path to ground. As such, the capacitor will slowly start to discharge. When the capacitor is fully discharged, the signal coming off the capacitor will be low, but this will be translated to high by the Schmidt trigger, resulting in a rising signal on the oscilloscope. The delay for that rising signal will be a function of the product of the rating of the capacitor and circuit resistance, also known as the RC time constant. Setting both to a product that will get you through the noise of the switch will help you filter out the noise from being detected by your interrupt pin, resulting in only one rising event and thus only one call to the interrupt function responsible for incrementing your tip counting variable. When the switch is open, the capacitor will begin charging again. The logic of the circuit will be reversed and the signal will be falling. 
Well, that kind of makes sense schematically, but uh, I'd really like to know what this looks like when it's uh, wired up to a breadboard with a Pro Trinket. So let's do that next. This shows how we would wire this circuit to an Adafruit Pro Trinket using a capacitor, a Schmidt trigger, and two resistors. Notice that we're going to be measuring uh, the uh, signal coming off the capacitor um, through the Schmidt trigger as shown uh, by the connection that's taking place through the uh, yellow wire which is going through the Schmidt trigger to pin 3 on the Pro Trinket. When the power is on and the switch is open, the capacitor charges and produces a high signal which is reversed as low when it passes through the Schmidt trigger to pin 3. Now when the power is on and the switch is closed, I provide a means for the capacitor to discharge through the circuit. The delay for the discharge will again be proportional to a product of the rating for the capacitor and the resistance of the circuit, giving me a means to set my debounce time through hardware rather than software. When the capacitor goes low, the resulting signal detected by pin 3 through the Schmidt trigger will be high. This will trigger my interrupt function, which will increment my tipping counter. Note how much we managed to simplify our code by using a hardware interrupt. We now have no need to call all those delays since the debounce constant is essentially built into the hardware. As such, we've eliminated all the issues in using timers in our interrupt service function. And here's a screenshot of my test trying different frequencies to see if I can break the counter. The results were good based on my counting during the test, demonstrating to me that the circuit is fairly robust. I'm certainly not suggesting that you have to replace a reed switch with a Hall effect sensor since the extended debounce approach seems to work out okay, at least initially. Nor am I advising anyone to pursue an RC Schmidt trigger circuit to filter out reed switch noise but I do think it's valuable to know that these alternatives are out there should you run into issues with your field deployments and need to do some debugging. As noted in the Argent documentation, the cup type anemometer measures wind speed by closing a fixed reed switch in the center of the anemometer. A one second rotation detected by the switch indicates a 1.492 mile per hour wind speed. If we were to detect two switch closures in one second, then the wind speed would be doubled. So let's see if we can get a closer look at the switch and magnet. And here's the reed switch. As with the tipping bucket ring gauge, the reed switch will be tied to an interrupt switch for logging the number of instrument turns within a given period of time, similar to how the rain gauge engages an interrupt for logging the number of bucket tips. Unfortunately, the magnet that engages the switch is embedded in the cup housing, so I wasn't able to get a good look at it without damaging the instrument. But you can hear it activating the reed switch as the cup turns. By registering these counts in memory, we can do some simple math to get an instantaneous measure of wind speed each second. We can do this by simply counting the number of reed switch closures during a one second period, and then multiplying that by the wind speed associated for one turn per second. This will give us the wind speed recorded during that one second interval. Note that this is pretty much an instantaneous value and probably should be averaged over time to provide you with a more representative reading of wind speed. And here's the code I prepared for this, most of which was copy-pasted from the Argent library.
This only reports the wind speed on a one second interval and doesn't take into account any statistical functions for smoothing the data. Here you can see that the interrupt service request function count anemometer is called each time the read switch is closed, resulting in the variable anemometer counter being incremented. In my loop, the variable wind speed is updated by the function read wind speed each second. That function does the math summarized in the last slide, resets the anemometer counter, and echoes the latest calculated wind speed back to my terminal window. For your reference, I've made the sketches summarized in this video available on my website. These sketches should not be considered a replacement for the libraries developed by Argent. These are simply my attempt to understand how to talk to these instruments and do not take into account noise filtering functions, which is something the Argent libraries do consider. On that note, I hope this video has given you a foundation upon which to further evaluate weather monitoring hardware, including wind vanes, tipping bucket rain gauges, and anemometers for your own purposes. As I've stated in the past, I'm a hydrologist and if not trained as a programmer or electrical engineer, I'm mostly self-taught. So if you have recommendations or see anything that needs correcting, please don't hesitate to comment. I'm using this venue in the hopes I can learn from the broader scientific community. I'll keep playing with these sensors and have field deployments planned, so please subscribe for updates. Thanks for watching. That's why the wind blows ooh. That's why the wind blows shh. That's why the wind blows ooh wee. That's why the wind.